Excellent. Thank you, Karen. And just to let you know, I just got a message from my computer saying that my internet connection is um, <clears throat> slightly unstable. So I'm going to leave my video off for just, well, I'll turn it on just briefly so you can see, yes, I'm really here. <laughs> <laughs> but I am going to turn it back off just to conserve bandwidth for the time being until it stabilizes. I'm not sure what exactly is going on, um, but thank you for your patience with that. And thank you so much for all of the wonderful information that you've been putting into the chat box so far this, uh, I would say this morning, except that it is actually this afternoon. Um, I do want to just mention at the very beginning that I think I may be coming down with something. So I am clearly not working at 100% capacity today by the fact that I think it's the morning time. So if I say something that sounds a little bit off or like maybe I just said the wrong word in general or you're just you've got a question, please feel free at any point during the next hour and a half to throw a question in the chat box. Or when we get to some of the question sessions sections, you can actually unmic and um, ask those questions because it might be that I misspoke because well, you know, it's one of those days. So, but I will do my best. I will do my best. So again, thank you so much for all of this information. Let me jot down one more little note here um, and then we will get going. All right, cool. All right. There you go. All right. So I am Tammy King, um, and you are hopefully here for understanding how children learn multiple languages. I work with Karen at uh, the Early Childhood Professional Learning uh, Department, which is part of the Center Resources for Teaching and Learning in Arlington Heights, though this afternoon I am actually sitting in my basement, not far from the office, actually. Um, I am the person uh, that primarily oversees our English as a Second Language and bi Bilingual Initiatives. I've been in this department now for just over six years, and before that I worked for 12 years in the Illinois Resource Center, which is a sister department, uh, so same parent organization, but different department um, at the uh, at the center. So if you have ever worked in the K-12 world and I look or sound somewhat familiar to you, that might be why you may have met me during my time at the IRC. I am a former teacher. I used to teach fourth and fifth grade uh, bilingual, um, bilingual Spanish. That's my second language. I also taught ESL bilingual pullout, um, which would have been a bunch of different languages. And uh, that would have been kindergarten through sixth grade before I got into doing professional development full time. All right. <clears throat> Let's see here. There we go. Some burning questions that we're going to get into this afternoon. I noticed a handful of people were asking about strategies. Some folks were looking for information for infants and toddlers. We've got kind of a gamut, a wide gamut of, of information that you're looking for this evening. Um, so hopefully we can. I'm going to weave some of that in as we go through the session. Um, but primarily, I organized this around the burning questions that you see on the screen before you right now. So first, is it helpful or harmful to grow up learning two or more languages? We'll answer that question shortly. What does it mean when a child switches between the languages as they speak? Is that something we should be concerned about, not concerned about, for instance? You know, what or what does it even mean? Um, what if a child doesn't do it? You know, what does what's all that about? And then what is developmentally appropriate practice related to dual language learners or DLLs? So we're going to get into some of that today. Now, as I said, we've got 90 minutes together. So it's four o'clock right now. We're going until about 530. Um, you can get an entire master's degree, doctorate in ESL bilingual ed. Um, you can get half a master's, you know, you can take you know, the ESL bilingual coursework, 18 semester hours. There's tons of work you can do on this. And I have um but in this field for a couple of decades, I will do my best to give you the most important nuggets of information in the next 90 minutes. But, you know, I can't teach you everything that I've ever learned. Um, but, I do, you know, I'll give it a shot in the next 90 minutes um, and hope to answer some of your questions. But please do know that this is just one of a number of free professional learning opportunities that we have available to you through our office that are dedicated to the unique needs of English learners. Speaking of English learners, you've already heard me use two different acronyms so far. So we've got DLL, ELL, EL. Maybe you've heard other ones like multilingual learner or simultaneous bilingual or sequential bilingual or, you know, all these different terms. Or when I first started in this field, limited English proficient was a was a trendy term um, back in the late 90s and the early O's. All right. So what's the deal with all these different acronyms? First of all, none of them that I just mentioned are offensive in any way, shape, or form. They're just different terms. Some have gone gone in and out of um, 
you know, common common parlance, but uh, they're all they're all okay terms to use. They do have different nuances in their meaning. So, for example, dual language learner or DLL that you see on the top of the screen right now, that's primarily used at the national level. So, organizations like Head Start and the National Association for the Education of Young Children, which is NACI, likes to use the term dual language learner, and it means any child who is growing up with exposure to more than one language, regardless of what their proficiency is in English just that they're growing up with multiple languages. English language learner was the term used by ISBE for a while before they at some point dropped the middle L and left us with just E-L like the train. And so this is English language learner, and then this is English learner. <clears throat> and these are children who are go growing up, um, you know, like a dual language learner, they're growing up with exposure to a language other than English. But when assessed in English, their English language proficiency is below that of a native English speaking student. So, but for the purposes of today, we're gonna to use these terms interchangeably. That's all right. Again, none of them are offensive in any way. Um, what's most important is that we are able to get our questions asked and answered in the next hour and a half. I tend to uh, use the term either English learner or multilingual learner, which is used a lot by the WIDA consortium. Um, again, variation on the same thing. All right. Now we're going to do a couple different uh, ways for you to participate this evening. This first one is called a waterfall chat. So if you haven't done this yet, let me explain. In just a second, you're going to type in the chat box whether you think it's helpful or harmful to grow up learning two or three or four or five languages. Then what's going to happen is, wait, don't hit enter. I'm going to count down and then we're all going to hit enter together and there's going to be this waterfall of answers in the chat so we can see what everybody thinks. So thanks, Lisa, for getting us started. Everybody else, if you would, in the chat, type in, do you think it's helpful or harmful to grow up or for our children to grow up speaking and learning multiple languages? So I'll give you about 10 more seconds to type. And three, two, one, hit enter. Let's see, I see, whoa, lots of helpfuls flying by. It also gives me a chance to take a drink of some tea. Excellent. All right, so I see lots and lots of helpfuls. Um, there might have been a harmful in there somewhere that I might have missed, but I so far I've only noticed helpful. Awesome. All right, cool. Part of that was a test to teach you how to do a waterfall chat because we're going to do it again in a little bit. <clears throat> Excellent. All right. Excellent. It is helpful. There is no research out there. And we've got 40 years worth of research in this area, right? There is no, I, I've yet to find any research that shows that it's harmful to grow up speaking multiple languages or being exposed to multiple languages. In fact, in most of the rest of the world, it's just normal that you grow up speaking multiple languages. So talking about names and terminology and stuff, we we're talking about English language learner, dual language learner and all that. Let me introduce you to two new terms that maybe you haven't heard yet. The first is simultaneous bilinguals. And so I'm gonna show you simultaneous bilinguals. This is my little visual to explain this concept. And then in a second, I'll also show you sequential bilinguals. <clears throat> Many of you are working with children, with families who are, um, who the children are simultaneous bilinguals. What does that mean? That means at birth or you know shortly after, so within the first year or maybe two years of life, the child is being exposed to two or more languages and they are learning those languages essentially simultaneously. Now, they may learn one primarily over the summer when they're home visiting grandma and grandpa in the old country and the other one, you know, during the week or during, you know, at um you know, at school or something like that, but still they're, they're developing these two languages simultaneously. Different from potentially their parents who may have been raised with one language from birth or shortly thereafter, um, but at a later point in life, in elementary school, junior high, high school or whatever, they added in that second language, or maybe it was at the time of kindergarten. So maybe at five years of age, they add in that second language. I myself am a sequential bilingual. I grew up speaking exclusively English until uh, third grade when I took my first Spanish class, started to learn a little bit of Spanish, and then uh, more intensively starting in junior high. My grandfather was also a sequential bilingual. He grew up speaking exclusively Italian until he got into first grade and started school in Chicago Public Schools back in the early 1900s, at which point he began learning English. So Again, just two different terms. Sequential means you start with one and add in the other at a later point in time. Simultaneous means you're developing the two more or less from, you know, the get-go. 
All right. So with that being said, do you have more simultaneous or more sequential bilinguals in your preschool? And maybe you don't know. So then you could type in the chat. I don't know. I got to find out. If you don't want to spell this entire word, because I get it, it's late. It's been a long winter. You can just write S-I-M or S-E-Q <laughs> in the chat. That would be totally fine. I get it. Or a question mark, because you don't know. And then on the count of three, we're going to hit go or enter, and we'll see what uh, see, see where we're at. All right. Mark, get set. I see some coming in. Go. Woohoo. Look at all that. Oh, wow. We've got quite the mix. I'm seeing a fair number of both flying by. Some simultaneous, some I don't knows. I think I saw at least a couple sequentials. Yep, some sequentials mixed in. Okay. All right. So why is this important? Is one better or one worse than the other? No, absolutely not. The point is we need to know. Because the language development of a child that's growing up with two languages from early, early, early in life is going to look different from someone who is learning a second language at a later point in life, right? You would expect me to speak Spanish differently because I started speaking Spanish in, you know, junior high than someone who was raised speaking it, right? In a, in a sense, simultaneo. Okay, thanks, Alex. Um, and the last couple of people put them in there. That's great. Um you're going to expect just different patterns in terms of their language. And it's helpful if we're looking at a child who might be having difficulty in the classroom or having um, issues in any way, we want to ask some of these questions and find out how have they been learning their languages and in what way. Um, again, nothing's right or wrong. It's just information to find out about our kids. One thing that you'll probably walk away from tonight with is the understanding that um, the one thing that is common about English language learners or English learners, multilingual learners, is that they're still in the process of learning English. That might be the only thing they have in common. It is a very diverse group of children, a very diverse group of families with lots of different needs, lots of different socioeconomic statuses, racial backgrounds, cultural backgrounds. Um, uh, cultural practices, religions, you know, every other thing can be different. But what keeps, what, what unites them together is the fact that they're still in the process of learning English, right? So this is one of those points of distinction, simultaneous versus sequential. Just want to find out. So speaking of same, different and diverse, we're going to be looking at this article today. This would have been one of the handouts that you received um, via the confirmation email, there would have been a link that you would have clicked on for the handouts. But for those that either don't have that, didn't see that, or otherwise um, don't have it handy, I'm going to dump it in the chat for you. Just give me a second. Uh, it's not a strength of mine to click and talk at the same time, but I'm going to give it a shot. Here we go. Same, different, diverse. There you go. It's uh, in the in the chat box for you momentarily. It's loading. And what we're going to do in just a second is we're going to put you into breakout rooms so that you can take a look at this document and look at the very first part of it. Yeah. Um, what this has in it is a couple of different charts. I'm going to try turning my video on because the internet seems to be happier now than it was earlier. There we go. All right. So in the same different diverse document, no need to print this. This is just something for you to have handy because it summarizes a lot of really great research that's out in the field about our kids. And the first portion of it talks about um, important similarities among all children. So both English learners, dual language learners, and kids who are growing up speaking only one language, which the term for that is monolingual children. So what I'm going to have you do here. <clears throat> in just a moment is get into breakout groups. We're gonna automatically put you in those groups. And I would like you to take a look at the same and different sections of this article. So that would be pages two and three, where it says important similarities among all children. Looks like that. And then the second page is key differences between dual language learners and monolingual children. Looks like that. I'm gonna ask you to take a look at that with the folks in your group and what surprises you, you know, as you look through the, the little um, summary statements, what are you surprised to see there? And then when you come back, I'm gonna ask that one person from each group share, um, or at least that you appoint someone from each group to share something maybe that you talked about. We do have 50 people in the room today, so we'll see um, how, we're, how we're gonna share out in just a minute or when we get back, but you're gonna have about five to six minutes in your breakout room. And you should get a warning about a minute before the breakout room is gonna close. So again, when you first get into those rooms, if you could decide the person whose uh, last name is closest to the front of the alphabet could be the record keeper, you know, or the, the note keeper for your group, um, that would be great. 
And there you go. see everybody starting to come back in the room. That's perfect. All right. <clears throat> so let's see. It looks like we had a total of seven rooms, but I'm going to ask for volunteers. Could I get uh, one or two people to share something that they discussed in their group? And you can just go ahead and come off the mic, or if you want to raise your hand, you could do that. That's fine. I'm just going to go first so I can get out of the way. Um, awesome. Thanks, Rose. Um, we did... We didn't get to the different section. We only were able to talk about the same. And we were talking about how we agreed and how we, our experiences with that. So we didn't even get to the different section. Um, but we had a really good discussion on the same. Excellent. Anything in particular, like really struck you guys as um, a surprise or, or worth talking a lot about? Just that they have a natural capacity to like, learn and then it depends on what language is spoken in the household most like if both languages are spoken in the household that they would have both um so we pretty much were talking about how we agreed with a lot of the what was on there we didn't even get to the last one the the last similarity <laughs> so and that's okay i mean this is a resource for you in the future too right but i'm glad to know that there was useful information on here for you guys or interesting information cool Awesome. Can I get somebody else? Thanks, Rose. Can I get somebody else who's willing to share? Um, I one one of the um things that surprised me under the save, same and different, is when they were talking about the greater demands on memory. It's something that I never really thought about. Like these children are learning two; they have to have two different sets of. You know, they have to know English and they have to know their home language and they're going between the two all day. And it, I never really thought about it like that, which is which I'm surprised by myself that I never really thought about it like that. Cool. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, it is. And it's it's not that it's confusing, but it is more of a cognitive load. Right. And as you're working between those, I remember translating like at IEP meetings from English to Spanish. And if I do it long enough, eventually my brain gets tired and I inevitably talk to the wrong language, use the wrong language and talk to the wrong person at some point, because it is it's, you know, it just takes some extra effort. So cool. Thank you. And can I get one last group that would be willing to, uh, oh, Nat, uh, Natal Natalia, I don't know, Natalie. There was an interesting point about additive and subtractive teaching. Yes, I had forgotten that was actually in this section. I thought it was in a different section, um, but it's that second white line on there about kids' environments can be additive or subtractive. Additive meaning that it supports them developing more than one language and subtractive meaning the opposite where diversity is not valued. Yep, and it makes a big difference for kids long-term and their long-term bilingualism as well as their long-term self-worth and self-esteem, whether they're in an additive situation or a subtractive one. Cool. All right. So they, uh, so we got three groups that shared this time. We've got a total of seven. So the next time we do a breakout, I'm going to be hitting up those other groups that haven't had a chance to share yet. And before I forget, if you would uh, just take a quick second to take a look at how your name is showing up in the, um, you know, in the, in the Zoom room. And if it's not the same one that you registered with, could you just change that? And you can do that by clicking on the three, three little dots and adding your last name or you can, or changing your name, or you can also do that by just putting it in the chat box as well. Um, and just telling us, oops, sorry, I'm logged in as such and such, but I'm actually such and such. We would appreciate that. All right. Oh, one last thing. I'm going to do this so I can close this window and see you guys easily. I am putting into the chat right now a different handout, which we're going to be referencing throughout the day today. You may already have this. Oh, my apologies. I sent it just to my coworker, Karen, not to all of you. Let me try this again. Links document to everyone. There we go. Now we're in business. Okay. Now you should have just received a second one in the chat box called links. And I'll tell you more about that as we go through the day, but I just want to make sure you have it handy. And because I can't click and talk well at the same time. All right. Speaking of which links handout number one. So on this links document, it looks like this, right? And uh, no need to print this. The reason why I give this to you is that you have all the electronic um, links all in one handy dandy handout. So anytime as we go through the day today, you see a yellow circle up in the right hand corner, it'll tell you which link I'm talking about. So it says links handout. And then that one references number one, where it says guiding principles of language development. So that's where you can find this text at a later time. In fact, that guiding principles of language development document looks like this. And this is from the WIDA Consortium, and this actually outlines um, 
oh, I don't know, 15, 16 pages of research studies around English language learners in early childhood. So if you ever are in need of research highlights and specific citations and titles and such, this is an excellent, excellent reference to go to. So I wanted to make sure you had that. And what we're going to do today is um, go through these different guiding principles of language development, kind of one by one, make this um, interesting for you. So this first one, multilingual children, or again, English learners, dual language learners, substitute the per, you know your preferred term. Multilingual children are learning more than one language at the same time, and they adjust the use of their languages to different sociocultural contexts. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about what we mean by that. DLLs, or multilingual learners, I need to fix this slide. Multilingual learners correct language-based miscommunications by switching languages. And this is actually called um, code switching. So what this means is we're not talking here about mistakes, but rather when bilingual children realize that two words can be easily confused between their two languages, or I'm sorry, or that there are two words maybe even in one language that sound similar to each other, they'll flip into one of their other languages for clarity. Um, to be able to make sure that the person knows what they're talking about. So they have a distinct reason for why what they're why they're switching languages or what's called code switching. That's one of many reasons why. <clears throat> also, young children will follow the lead of the adults. So we've been talking a little bit about um, children that are simultaneous bilinguals growing up with multiple languages and how they can process both languages if that's what they're being exposed to from a young age. And they absolutely can do that. Here's something that, you know, for the infant and toddler folks in the room, and I know we've got a handful of you, here's something that's really cool. If a child is being raised as a simultaneous bilingual, and uh, like some somebody gave the example of um, French and Lingala, let's go with that, or that I know there was like um, somebody else said Russian and another language, but let's say French and Lingala, because that's a fairly common pairing, right? Uh, let's say one of the parents speaks exclusively French with the child, another parent speaks exclusively Lingala with the child. All right, Lingala is a language from uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, typically from the DRC, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. The languages themselves sound very different, right? And so the parent that's always speaking French to the child, the child will actually grow up and by six months of age start babbling in the sounds of French to the parent that speaks French to that child. And they'll babble with the sounds of Lingala to the parent that speaks Lingala to that child. At six months of age, long before we could ever possibly conceivably try to explain to a child the concept of different languages and this parent speaks that one and that parent speaks that one, they're already automatically doing it with the sounds that they're babbling with. It's really cool. Um, so they're following the lead of the adults in their lives. And that is a common way that people will raise their child bilingually, by the way, is to do one parent, one language. Um, so it doesn't have to be that way, but that is a common way to do it. All right. Uh, switching to fill gaps and, uh, to communicate more clearly. Sorry, I've got a box covering up part of you guys. Okay. Um, this is another reason why we will switch in between different languages, right? So like I told you, I speak Spanish and I speak English. So if I'm talking to somebody that I know is bilingual and I want to tell them a story about something um, with my comadre, I might just switch in into Spanish and just say the word comadre and, you know, how we got to see my comadre this weekend and she got this really lovely gift for my son and, you know, whatever. But if I'm talking to someone that doesn't speak Spanish, I now have to, I can't just flip into Spanish and say comadre. I have to actually explain what does comadre mean and that relationship, which is is almost like an auntie, but actually it's more specifically like my children's godmother, right? But I don't have to say all those extra words if you just know what the word comadre means. For some reason, we don't have that word in English, um, the equivalent. All right. Two, multilingual children learn language and culture through their experiences at home and in the community and in the early care and education environments that they find themselves in. All right. And if you've got questions along the way, please feel free to just throw them in the chat box if, if you'd like to do that. Just so. Pardon me. <clears throat> All right, so here's what I would like to do real quick with you is show you this video. Um, could I get a quick show of hands from you, either your actual hand if your camera's on or the little Zoom hand if you have seen this video before. It's called The Gift and it comes from the Cox Center on the Atlanta Speech School in Georgia. All right, so I'm seeing a whole lot of nothing. So this is new to you guys. Thanks for us for shaking your head. That helps me feel like I'm not talking to myself. I appreciate that. <laughs> All 
All right, so I'm going to show this to you. I think this is well worth a couple of minutes to watch this. Um, and then we'll talk about it a little bit after the fact. All right, here we go. And can somebody give me a thumbs up if the audio is working? You guys go ahead and find a station to play. Good morning, Diana. Good morning, Miss Bethany. How are you? Wonderful. Good morning, Valentina. How are you? Go ahead and use your step away, okay? It's great to hear. I know she. Valentina, you don't need that right now. We're getting. Oh. oh, so sorry. Let me fix that. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and use your step away, okay? Mm -hmm. Follow your vacation. It's great to hear. I know you. Valentina, you don't need that right now. We're getting ready to learn. Please go put it on the shelf. You think I don't need my gift, but I really do. Me siento perdida when you take it away. Well, good morning, Angela. Yeah. How are you? Good. Good. It's great to see you. Go ahead and put your backpack over there, okay? Here's an owl and a frog and a mouse. Every morning, we bring our gift to school, the gift of our first language. Why do you think the animals go to school at night? Zoe. They're nocturnal. They don't go to sleep at night. Okay. Valentina, what do you think? Valentina? Every morning, you take our gift away. You think it will get in the way of our learning. ¿Y por qué? ¿Por qué son animales nocturnos? Porque en la día está durmiendo y en la, en la noche están despiertos. When you only look at what we can't do yet in English, you miss all the things you know and can do. Why won't you let us use our first language to make sense of all the new things you teach us? Oh, Angela, don't take your shoes off. We don't take our shoes off here. My culture and my language go together. They're part of who I am. Learning is easier when you accept all of me. Okay, everybody, listen up. I want you to sort your bears into small and large, okay? Valentina, small and large. Small and large. Pequeño, small. Grande, large. <gasps> Pequeño, small. Grande, large. Today, we are going to greet our friends in their own special language. And guess what? When we come inside from the playground, we're going to take our shoes off, just like Angela does when she's at home. Okay? You ready to sing? Okay, let's start. Ready? Ming la ba, Angela. Angela is our friend. When you use words and songs in our first language and connect them with English, our learning takes off. Our families can help, and you can remind them they help us best when they keep talking, singing, and reading with us in our first language. Um, yo tengo un, um, un, unos animales doctuno. You may think our English-speaking friends know more than we do, but our bilingual brains are amazing. 
They think in two languages and give us the power to express ourselves on both of them. <sighs> It's not confusing at all. Large, familiar fingers into a fan. Next, he leaned forward and kissed the center of her hand. Now, Chester didn't want his mother to be worried. That's right, worried. And in Spanish, we say, preocupado. My first language is my gift. It helps me grow and shine. I know you want that for me, for all of us, now and in the future. Gain a book, baby. Come on, touch the thing. Hi, all from Lima. After who had it? Abre mi regalo and watch me change the world. So I, I learned quickly that if I clicked on the chat box while the video played, I couldn't actually play the video. So just a second as I catch up on what's in the chat box. <clears throat> okay, so we got some reactions to the to the video. Right. They do a very good job in this video, I think, of showing kind of the, the transformation of the teacher. Right. But also somebody was saying they didn't really like the teacher at first. Right. Um, and, and you might, you know, be a little verklempt at this point. I know sometimes people do you know do feel that way after watching this the first time but um it, it, this this brings home that point right of why this is important work that we do why it's important to value the native language and the native cultures of our kids um this video comes from like i said the cox campus at atlanta speech school and they are dedicated to and committed to making sure these videos can be widely distributed for free um, so you can actually get it off of youtube and i'm realizing i should have put the link in the links thing and i didn't do that um, I will do that for next year. But if it's something that you would like, I'd be happy to send you the link, though, frankly, it's pretty easy to find if you Google it, too. Maybe during our next breakout, I will find the link and, and throw it in the chat box for you so you've got it. Um, strategic use of the home language in school supports our kids learning English. We saw that in that video just now, right? Even if it's just a little bit, a couple of words can just be that thing, that spark that helps a kid connect um, to the classroom, to their teacher, and to know what to do um, in the classroom. Sometimes it doesn't take much. Even better if we can teach a child bilingually, but even that little bit can make all the difference in the world. Also with families too, right? Um, unfortunately, it's blocking off the very top of the screen right now, but this is talking about the um, native languages and cultures being the foundation for our children's learning. All right, so in the chat box, we've I've shared a little bit with you. We watched the video. How are you incorporating your children's home languages into your classroom? Can you share some ideas, some things that you've done? This could be something as simple as um, getting, you know, songs from the families, music from the families, and playing it or having it available to children to listen to, like in a calm down center or a listening center. Um, like lullabies or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, you know, any number of things. What What is it that you're doing right now or that you've seen done um, in programs, in early childhood programs where they're incorporating the children's home languages into the classroom, even if the teacher doesn't speak that language? So if you would, this is one of those where you just type it in the chat box and, and go. It's not a waterfall. Just when you're done typing, hit enter. All right. Um, I saw, I think it was Rose said, uh, songs are easy to incorporate into the classroom. Um, bilingual books. Every morning, uh, Carly is singing the same song in two different languages, using books in different languages. Thank you, Anne, for that. Um, it's bigger so I can read it. Um, using books in different languages, labeling materials in the students' home languages, speaking a handful of words in the home languages, and asking the kids to teach those to you. And families as well, right? I mean, families can teach you, um, especially nowadays. I mean, I was teaching before smartphones, but nowadays we can record things very easily. Sorry, I just dated myself, made myself sound really old, didn't I? All right, um, adding books in students' languages, environmental print, labeling on food packages, totally in dramatic play centers, absolutely. Um, labeling things, adding languages all around the room. 
environmental print asking parents to come in and read stories. And if you've got parents that maybe are reluctant to read stories in the classroom or maybe don't even have access to books, um, depending on the circumstances in which they move to this country or their own literacy levels themselves, they might not be comfortable doing that. But they can still tell, and many of us have very rich oral traditions and we can tell stories even without a book per se, um, you know, to read in the classroom. And wouldn't that be a cool way to incorporate families um, and even showing families um, and other kids diverse ways of print, right? Like Arabic goes from right to left, whereas English goes from left to right. We can show them that with picture books and different books. Um, oh, bilingual speech therapy. Cool. All right. Lots of lots of good stuff. Excellent. I'm going to say this now so I don't forget to say it later. Um, I know, you know, we're multiple years into the pandemic, but I've learned that not everybody knows this Zoom trick. So I'm going to share it with you. Down in the bottom of the chat box, you've got that little thing. looks like a smiley face, something where you add a file. There should be three little dots for more. If you click on that, there's a thing. There's a little button that pops up for save chat. So I would suggest you do that. Um, you know, I'll do it now, but I'll usually do it again towards the end of a session like this one because I want to hang on to all those really good ideas that you just shared of ways that you're incorporating the native language. And so anyway, you can do that at any point in time and save the entire chat to your computer and have it um, for your reference later on. All right, number three, languages and language varieties that are used by multilingual kids and their families are valuable resources to be considered and incorporated into early care and education and everyday routines and activities. Again, this whole thing is spelled out on that um, first link handout. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Karen just threw the YouTube link for the movie in the um, chat box for you. So if you need it, you can grab it from there. Again, when you save that chat, you'll get it that way too. All right. Thank you, Karen. Um, the language of the home should be incorporated, again, into early care and education activities and some of the ways that we've already talked about. Music, song, could be art as well. <laughs> um, this is a, a, a resource that I like a lot that we'd have put out early in the pandemic, but it's still available. This is link number two on your handout. And this is called Learning Language Everyday Activities for Families. And I'm not going to read it all to you, obviously, but you can see there's different pages in it. Like here's one that talks about moving and playing and looking at the picture and describe how they're moving and they're playing and they're doing different things. And here's another page that's all about weather. And you could draw a picture of what it's like outside, right? And there's a little word bank on the bottom. Very cute. This is available to you in English, Arabic, Simplified Chinese, Dari, Korean, Pashto, Spanish, and Ukrainian. And I put all the links on the link handout for you. So you just click on it and boom, you can open it up. It's the same pages in all of those languages. So you'll get the moving and play in each of those languages. Weather. If you want all the languages, you are going to have to click on each language that you want. You can't get it as like one massive download. You got to click on the ones you want. But it's all free. Totally free. Uh, International Children's Digital Library. This is handout number, handout uh, link, handout three. On your page, it'll take you right to this, um, this website, which again, free. I'm a big fan of the free. Um, you can actually listen to books being read in other languages by clicking on the links here. This is something that you could share with families. You could use in the classroom. You'll see here from our shelves. I took the screenshot a while ago, so it might look slightly different if you go on the website now. But you can see you can click on different languages and then it'll pull up storybooks in those languages. And then you can have them read to you. So like Mongolian, Persian, Farsi, English, so on and so forth. Um, so that's a handy, handy dandy resource too, as well, to incorporate native language. And then last year, a couple of years ago, someone on this very webinar shared this website with me because I was not familiar with it. So this is link number four, and this is called Unite for Literacy. And again, this has books in a bunch of different languages. Um, and you can actually, I, I happen to clip the, um, the Spanish version of the site, but you can actually have the books read to you as well. And you can flip it back into English if, you know, if you can't read in Spanish. So it's not advancing. There we go. Ah, narration languages. Cool. It worked. So you can see all the different languages that you can have books read to you in on the Unite for Literacy website. So you've got Vietnamese, French, Korean, German, Arabic, Russian. Somebody said they've got a new Russian population. Somebody else said they've got Creole, though I don't know what kind of Creole. If it's Haitian, there you go. Um, Italian, Portuguese. Um, so, so lots of good stuff there for you. All right. For those of you that need or want the references to Illinois, Illinois, uh, Illinois 
early learning and development standards, the IELDS. Sometimes I'm asked this question, like this is all great and wonderful. I'm, it's great to know that there's, you know, all these resources out there. The video is lovely, you know, but when it comes down to brass tacks, I got to cite IELDS, right? For my administrators, I got your back. Goal 28 and 29 are specifically about home language development and English language development. So I'm going to show both of um, these goals to you very quickly. So this is goal 28, use the home language to communicate within and beyond the classroom. And then you can see the preschool benchmarks talking about um, mastery of benchmarks through the home language, use of home language with family, community, early childhood settings, developing an awareness of different cultural contexts. And then there's um, descriptors down here too for these two different goals. Here you've got uh, using the home language across academic and social areas, um, expressing their current understanding and construct new concepts through the languages. So lots of good um, things that you can cite if that's something that you need to do in the future. All right, so children learn from their family's use of language for conversation, for reading, for writing, for rhyming, for singing. This is why, this is yet another reason why it's important to emphasize um, that families use their strongest languages with their kids, right? Because what is most important, one of the most important things is that our children are exposed to rich and diverse ways of using language. And so they're going to get the best, the richest linguistic environment at home if parents are using their strongest languages with their kids. And so we would prefer that they be using their strongest languages with their kids, even if that language is not English, even if that language is not Spanish, you know, if their home language is Chichimeca or some other native indigenous language, fantastic. Use that language at home with your kids. It's not going to be confusing. It's not going to be harmful. In fact, they're going to be exposed to that much more richness in language and oral traditions that will help them become highly literate human beings as time goes on. We can take care of the English at school. The only place they can get the native language sometimes is at home. Multilingual children benefit from continuous home language development at all levels. Even if they're deemed fluent English speakers, they can still and will benefit from home language development. Um, it, I mean, this is just a fact. Um, it never hurts to continue developing in your languages. All right, so here's a chance for you to chat because it's been a little while for you to type something. So how do you encourage your parents to use their strongest languages at home with their kids? So if you would put that in the chat box there. So how do you encourage the parents to use their strongest languages with their kids, even when those languages are not English or not Spanish? What have you found success um, with in doing that? And as soon as you're done typing, whatever that uh, those ideas are, go ahead and hit enter because this is not one of those waterfall things. Um, we just want you to throw the ideas in. Ah, I see one coming right now. Excellent. All right. So, oh, Illinois early learning tip sheets. Yes, those are awesome. Sharing oral stories. Um, the most important thing is to be able to communicate effectively with the little ones and the big ones, too. I mean, that's like kind of a secret. Not really. Two, if you continue using your native language at home with your kids and developing that native language with your children, they won't lose it. Here's the thing. Honestly, I mean, I've been in this field for tw over 20 years. The difficulty in this in this country is not learning English. The difficulty in this country is is not losing your native language. You will learn English if you if you continue to live here, but will you lose the native language? And our so many of our parents moved to this country for their kids to have a better life and a better education than they would have gotten in the home country. The, and they want their children to be bilingual doctors and lawyers and such, you know, someday and teachers. Well, the only way they're going to be bilingual doctors and lawyers is if they keep that native language as they add in the English. So we need to have them continuing to, to develop that native language. So it's using the tip sheets. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so um, yeah, you, so, there's, so the idea of using their strongest language at home with their kids. So I'm seeing folks saying sometimes they don't necessarily explicitly talk about it, but it is good to do so because sometimes our parents have gotten this kind of unwritten message. Um, sometimes it comes from the media that, they sh that it's going to confuse their kids, even though we know there's no research to that effect. It is important to tell them to use their, their strongest languages with their kids. You know, the emphasis should not be on English in the home. 
Um, and oh my gosh, I just happened to land on your comment that you've not had a situation yet where a parent needs encouragement. Oh, that makes me feel so good. Um, that's awesome. I'm really, really glad to hear that. Unfortunately, that has not been my experience. I often um, would run into parents who needed a lot of encouragement to use the non-English language at home with their kids. So that really makes me feel good that, that uh, you know, the tide is turning. Um, okay. And here's something else I got to tell you, right? So as a bilingual teacher, my parents expected me to tell them to use their native language at home with their kids. You know who, who it carried more weight from? was from the monolingual English teacher. When the monolingual, the English only speaking teacher told them to speak their native language at home with their kids, they believed them more than they believed me. You know, it's kind of interesting, right? But they expect it from me because I'm the one that's bilingual. But when they said, when an English speaking teacher said, please, please, please use your native language at home with your kids, read them books in that language, you know, get online, talk on, you know, with family members in other parts of the world in that native language, please, that's a good thing to do. It's like, oh, all right. You know, so don't underestimate the power of you having that conversation, even if you're not a bilingual teacher. Um, awesome. Cool. All right. This is another favorite resource of mine. This is handout number five. Um, family connections through the home language. One second. Excuse me. Um, and this goes through and talks about the importance of using non-English languages at home with kids and how you can do that. And this document, again, is available in eight different languages off the WIDA website for free. And um, you'll see all the links to those languages again on the links sheet under section number five. All free to download and use. Oh, typically, this is a one-sheeter, right? So typically what I used to do in my school district is I would run the, the English copy on one side and the other language on the back so that way families could flip it over and look at whatever side they wanted. Um, that way, also, if the paper's left lying around somewhere, you know, what it's about, you know, if someone doesn't speak, um, you know, Dari, like, what is this sheet about? Who does it go to? Well, if you've got English on the other side, that can help you figure it out. All right. Um, cognate. This is a, you know, little, uh, little thing to share with you as well. These are my two languages, right? So English and Elefante, which is Spanish. This demonstrates um, this notion or this linguistic term of cognates, which are two words that sound the same and are spelled in similar ways between two different languages. Conversational English pulls its words largely from German. All right. But academic English largely comes from Latin and Greek. Here's yet another reason why our children should be continuing to use their native languages at home with their kids, for example, in Spanish. There's not a lot of overlap between conversational English and conversational Spanish, some, but not a lot. Where there is a lot more overlap is in academic English with any kind of Spanish, because all of Spanish comes from Latin and Greek. It's a Romance language and academic English comes from Latin and Greek. And so the more Spanish, for example, the, our kids know, the easier high level technical vocabulary will come easier to them. Like pulmones, which means lungs, can help you figure out pulmonary specialist, which is a, you know, lung doctor, for example. So it's perfectly acceptable. In fact, it's best practice to teach kids how to compare and contrast the languages that they have. If I remember right, I think this is Farsi. If I'm wrong, someone correct me. Um, but I believe this is Farsi. And so you can see how different these, these words look when they're written. I have no idea how to pronounce Farsi, but it's okay to teach kids, you know, the, and show them print in different languages. And if you're able to say it or have someone help you pronounce it, well, all the better, right? To show them how language works. Farsi is like Arabic. It goes from right to left. So you start writing here and you would write like this, right? And then you add the diacritical marks below. And sometimes if it's like Arabic, sometimes they go above, like you see here, right? Um, different from the way we write in English. But yet those, both of those show the concept of an app, right? And so that's something that can be done in bilingual classrooms or even monolingual English classrooms as well. You can have like the word red in the middle and then have red written in all the different languages going around the outside or other concepts that you're teaching, shapes, squares, you know, whatever it might be. <clears throat> that would be a perfectly good thing to do. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, number five, multilingual children follow different paths for language development than those, um, than their monolingual learners. Oh, what's that here? Okay, so multilingual children follow different paths 
Um, we talked a little bit about the babbling, about how children that are being raised as simultaneous bilinguals will actually babble in the sounds of each of their languages to the proper caregiver, whomever that caregiver is. It's a really cool thing. Um, as early as three years of age, children who are being raised with two languages can walk up to just a stranger on the street and I forgot the exact percentage, but at a very high percentage, speak to that person in the right language before they've even heard them speak because they've picked up on social cultural clues over their three years, their 36 months of life on this planet. And they can actually distinguish probably what language this person is going to speak and address them in the proper language and in the proper way as young as three years old without explicit instruction. That's pretty cool. We are hardwired to learn more than one language. Again, not confusing at all. All right. Um, here's another resource that I wanted to share with you as well. The links handout number six. Um, sometimes folks ask me about support for lesson planning and trainings and such. This, if you go to the link on number six, you'll find the Making Connections document for Illinois. This is a comprehensive resource that's going to offer you suggestions, tools, sample lesson plans for teachers on how to pull together the IELDS, the Illinois Early Learning and Development Standards, as well as the WIDA resources and standards to provide um, and to create equitable lesson plans and learning opportunities for the kids in our care. You'll also find all sorts of other resources and on-demand um, trainings and, and things there as well. All right, so I'm gonna take a, a break here for a second and give you a chance to ask any questions that you might have at this point. You can either put them in the chat or you can unmute and ask as well. All right, so any questions that you might have? Not seeing anything come in. All right. Give me like one more minute. Let me see if anyone's typing. Okay, doesn't look like it. All right. More questions come up, just throw them in there for me. All right, here's what I'm gonna have you do next because maybe the questions will come up as you, as you go into breakout groups. Oh, hey, there we go. We got a question. All right. What is the best language for students to learn English? All right. So it kind of depends on how you define like best, right? Um, I would say that ideally being raised with more than one language from birth, whether that's, you know, English and Spanish, French and Lingala, um, Jamaica and Spanish, you know, like whatever the two languages are, learning them from birth, um, they will actually develop in the same region of the brain. So like if you were to look at a brain scan, you would see both languages developing in like this area here. When you learn a second language later in life, so you're a sequential bilingual, they actually form in two different sections of your brain if you were to look at a brain scan. So, um, you know, um, it, there's different advantages to when you learn it. Sometimes people talk about how the younger the child is, the easier it is to learn the language. Um, in a way, yes, in the sense that there's less to learn because what a five-year-old knows in English versus what a 15-year-old knows in English is, is more, so there's more to learn. But arguably, when you are proficient in your first language and you've already broken the code, you've learned um, how to read, you've become a literate human being, it's much easier to learn literacy in other languages. I think the biggest trouble is when we ask kids to learn how to read for the first time in a language they're not yet fluent in. Because then what happens, and, we, and this is like an epidemic here in the United States, of kids that have learned how to word call, they've learned how to decode, they can read out loud in English and have no idea what they've read. And that's because they were forced into reading English before they were actually conversationally and academically fluent in it. Um, so I would I would throw that out there to you. Okay, I see a couple of questions that just came in. Hold on a sec, I got to back up. Uh Okay, best age. So I'd say, yeah, I mean, if not birth, which usually when you're a teacher, you don't have control at that point, you know, what they, they come to you when they come to you, you can start introducing a second language to a child at any point, but it's also about the balance. So you want to make sure, again, you're continuing to develop the native language in the child and making sure that they're learning content while they're learning English. And often the best way for them to learn content is through the native language. So you don't want to withdraw the native language too soon. You can add in the English, but don't withdraw the native language. Um, quickly or too quickly. Um, the quickest lay way to learn Spanish. Again, we're talking about, are we talking about academics or are we talking about um, social language as well, right? 
You can become conversationally fluent relatively quickly, but academic language in any language when you learn it is gonna take some time. Um, do speech language pathologists get training in multilingual, multilingual learning features? We got at least one speech path on here. Does she or he know the answer to that question? My understanding, at least, at least back in the day, was speech paths don't necessarily have training in this area unless they sought out ESL bilingual certification. But I don't believe it's part of like standard SLP training. But please correct me if I am wrong on that. Um, I so this is Jasmine yes. Donnelly. Sorry. Um, so awesome. I yeah. would say, speaking from my own personal experience, I mean, I I agree with you in the sense that yeah, I would say there's not like a specific like program or training that happens in within our graduate program. However, they usually will offer like a course in um, a multicultural kind of multilingual, uh, you know, multilanguage learning. Um, and, you know, typically we're required to do um, projects where we all focus on a particular culture or language and what the aspects of that and the features of that are so that we have that as a resource moving forward. Um, but yeah, I would say it's not like formal training per se. And I think that's probably a similar thing could be described for your average, say, elementary teacher or even early childhood teacher, right? It might have been a course you took or part of a course we took. But um, to really go in depth on it, you would have to go seek out additional training in that area, right? To really learn more or do more reading or do more training like on job. Like I'm thinking, I know there are like there's some resources out there and I can't remember the book off the top of my head, but like we'll actually talk about articulation differences and like um, grammatical differences between different languages so that you can see when you see particular um, kids presentations of language, whether that's a language thing or it's a, um, I can't even think of what the terminology is right now. My apologies. But anyway, it helps you determine, you know, like what it is that's going on with the child. If right, I can cool. jump in as a speech path, can you oh, hear yeah, me? Please do, Deborah. Yes, absolutely. Hi. I'm a speech path, and I feel like what you said is absolutely correct, but in my training, there was a level of awareness they wanted us to have, meaning mm -hmm. they wanted us to be, very much understand that if a child presents like they might have a language disorder, you need to make absolute sure that it's not a difference and that they are learning two languages at once. And then they also gave us resources um, to look into like perhaps the phonology. I know a great resource that I absolutely just used today is to go to the ASHA website and type in the language and look at the phonology just to take a peek at, okay, let's say they can't say ask lens. Well, is it because they're delayed or is it because they're in a home where they very rarely heard ask lens? Or like, I know, for example, um, and that's if you want to dump the actual ASHA website in there, I just put a reminder in the chat box um, about it. I just don't happen to know what it is off the top of my head. Um, it's just like ASHA.org. Oh, is it just? Oh, well, there you go. Okay. I, I would have guessed that, but I didn't want to assume. <laughs> no um, worries. Um, like I know, for example, I was once told that in the Russian language, there is no indefinite article. Like the word the doesn't exist in Russian. So when you have, I used to have a student that was, that was coming from Russian and learning English and he would always leave out the, when he was speaking, even when you needed to have it, he just didn't put it in there. Well, it didn't exist in his home language. So it was just this whole new word that frankly doesn't mean a whole lot, but yet you need it. Right. Um, and so that helped us understand that it was a language difference because of the language he was coming from and the language he was learning, not necessarily um, something that would fall under like a pathology, I guess you could say, right? And I'm sorry Absolutely. For the so no speech pathologist that I know <laughs> exists that can have such um, depth of knowledge to know all the languages. So we really just have to know when we need to seek support and look to another speech language pathologist who is fluent in that language. But we just really need to be sensitive not to call people disordered when they're not. Yep. And that's awesome to know that the ASHA website has something that you can look up too some of those distinctions between different languages. Because frankly, the ones I know are only because of kids that I've had along the way. Um, so awesome, cool. I'm glad I know that. Thank you. All right, so without further ado, I wanna give you guys more time to talk in your groups. So let's spend about five, six minutes again, taking a look at the rest of that um, article. So the next section is about what surprises you in the diverse section. So there is, um, there's two pages where it says DLLs, I'm sorry about the coughing. Um, that DLLs are a highly diverse group, and it talks about some of the differences. So take a look at that. 
or if you wanted to go back to some of the stuff you didn't get to talk enough about in the first time you went to breakout, that's fine as well. I will ask the groups that haven't yet shared to share when we come back in about, <clears throat> oh my gosh, I'm sorry, in about six minutes or so. So we will see you then. If you need to, click that blue button to go back into the group. Here from uh, their group discussion. <clears throat> once twice all right all right so number six multilingual children follow unique paths of language development according to the exposure and opportunities that they have for learning their different languages so we've talked about some of that again that amount of exposure predicts their rate of development so here we have a brother and a sister right an older brother a younger sister it's very very common in families for you know, talking about this language loss from one generation to the next, often it's the oldest sibling in the family, the oldest child that has the most control of the native language. And by the time you get you know to the youngest kid, sometimes that youngest child at best can recognize some words in in the native language, but you know almost exclusively communicates through English. Um, and that's very, very, very common in this country for that to happen. Um, again, it I'm depends sorry, on the I, amount of exposure. <clears throat> Yeah, please. How does, that, how does that happen? Like, I have four kids and I expose them to Spanish, but you're right. Like, my youngest is the one that doesn't really understand it and doesn't speak it. But they were all exposed to the same amount. Is that because they have older siblings and they speak English to them more? Or why is that? I mean, I'm not a researcher, but I can tell you from the stuff that I've read and just anecdotal experiences from families, um, the families where this has not happened or not happened as badly are families that have essentially banned English in the home. Oh, okay. Um, because otherwise it just, like I said, the 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 problem, the, the battle in this country is the loss of the native language. It's not about learning English. Hmm. It just, it's just, that's how it is right now in this country. They, we, everybody will learn English if they stay here. It's how fast are you gonna lose the native language? And so there are families that have had great success with saying, you know, this is a Spanish only home, or, you know, pick your language, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we're only going to be sp speaking Spanish in the home, you know, with the possible exception of say homework help or something like that. And if all communication is happening in Spanish, well, then you got to learn it, you know? Um, it's not easy though, especially as they hit like fourth, fifth, sixth grade, it gets really mm -hmm. hard. Technology too, doesn't help. Um, okay. You know, depending on their screen use. Um that can that can exacerbate it too okay thank you so yeah, yeah. okay oh, i'm gonna have to do something with these screens because it's blocking some of my um slides so hold on one second let's just say positive influence of native speakers all right yeah so this is kind of what we're talking about right like you want to have people around that can speak those languages um because it's going to impact the kids language development we basically talked about this already but in different ways okay so when parents speak more english it does not impact. All right, this is really interesting. Let me read this because I don't want to add a little bit. Um, in a three-year longitudinal study of language practices of mothers of preschool dual language learners, so preschoolers growing up with more than one language, it was found that their increased use of English in the home did not, did not impact the children's English vocabulary or their emergent literacy development. However, the increased use of English slowed the growth of the children's Spanish vocabulary. This is a very like complicated way of saying essentially what we were just talking about. You know, if the parents stop speaking the native language, it doesn't necessarily accelerate the kids' English so much, their English growth so much as it decreases their Spanish, I guess. So it's especially like at a young age. So like when you have families that are like, I'm only going to speak English at home with the kids, but then the parents themselves don't speak very much English. What happens is there's less language in the home. And so it's not as a language rich environment for the kids. And so it doesn't necessarily increase their English, but it does decrease the native language, like in this case, Spanish. So I guess a little different than what we were just talking about, but but related in a way. I hope that makes sense. Um, if not, I can elaborate. All right. The development of languages related to the use of that language. Again, we've kind of talked about this, but the, the way kids develop language is dependent on their exposure to that language, everyday interactions through that home language. You know, if they're continuing to be exposed to it and continuing to need to use that language, then they will continue to actually use it. Um, 
Oh, let's see here. All right. Personal preference and play partners. All right. Um, this, I think, is just kind of an interesting thing. We're going to talk a little bit more about this in a second. But um, you can think about in your early childhood classroom or if you've got kindergarten, first grade teachers on here, who are the kids choosing as their play partners? And kids that have more than one language, you want them to be playing and using their native language in play because they're actually going to attain higher levels and engage in higher levels of play. I've got a whole workshop I do on this. But they'll, they'll reach higher levels of play and take on different roles, for example, which is really important in play. Um, be able to take on different ways of using language in play, like if they're pretending to be a uh, airplane pilot or something like that, right? Um, or pretending to be a TSA person if you set up that in like your, your um, dramatic play area. They're going to be able to attain higher levels of play through that native language or through the ability to use all of their languages as they play with different kids in the classroom. So just, you know, some things to think about as you structure your classroom and the kind of language use that you allow in your classroom as well, even if you yourself don't speak those languages. And also the develop, the um, incorporation of culturally relevant activities. So here's some photos of preschool classrooms with some dramatic play areas. Dramatic play is huge. This is where you will see kids act out their cultural experiences, right? Um in 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 real life so you see here down in the corner these kids are using little tortilla presses different kinds of metal one and a wood one to make little play-doh tortillas and then after this they actually like went around the room and delivered the like little tacos to kids in different centers around the room because they thought they needed like a you know quote-unquote snack um so it was really cute and then over here you've got other kids playing and so sometimes people will tell me you know and, and we think about eckers right like eckers talks about the you know having plastic sushi like in your in your dramatic play area and that's all lovely um, but what if you don't have Japanese or Korean kids in your classroom? You shouldn't really be stopping at the plastic sushi, but rather making sure you're incorporating your kids' food in the classroom, right? We talked about that earlier with packages that you can incorporate in dramatic play of, of like empty food packages, um, asking families to bring that in. But also now that we're finally, a, you know, a little bit removed from the pandemic, we can start bringing parents back into the classroom to volunteer. Get your parents, your multilingual parents to volunteer in the dramatic play area. That will help it become naturally more culturally relevant for your kids because they can bring things in and they can help arrange things in that dramatic play or to area to make it more recognizable to the children. And therefore they will talk more about it if they know what the stuff is that's in there right? You can do something as simple as having families photograph their meals for a couple of days and send you the photos and print them and attach them to a paper plate. And then you put that in your dramatic play area as pretend food, you know, or pretend dishes that they can, you know, make, right? All right. Um, how do you incorporate, I gave you a couple of my ideas, but how do you incorporate kids' home cultures into your dramatic play area? If you've got an idea or two, you can throw that into the chat for me and hit Hit enter as soon as you're done typing. Give me just a second. I'm deciding what to skip over here. So while you guys type, I'm making some decisions here. Ah, yes. Okay. And if you don't have any ideas, that's okay. You know, if you're going to take away some ideas from today, that would be awesome. I do have a whole nother session, like I said on this. Ooh, multicultural dolls and food. That caught my eye. Plato tamales. Yes. Um, uh, oh, Bobby, you want to get some more ideas in this area? Yeah. Okay. Um, fabrics, different kinds of fabrics too that you can put in there that can be used, like different lengths of big pieces of fabric that can be used in all sorts of different ways, like to wrap babies or for clothing, you know, like that kind of thing. Um, that can be a relatively inexpensive way to incorporate some stuff. Um, you know, I'm thinking of like the napping, the napping house, you know? Um, um, so that can be something you can add. Um, oh, different types of cash and the toy register. Yeah, talking about like different ways of using, it to, except for this, right? Except some kids don't even know cash anymore because all they're used to is plastic, but that's a different situation um that's that's more of a generational thing food containers clothes utensils yeah awesome cool this is where if you don't know rely on your families right and sign up for my next work my workshop that's coming up too awesome cool so some good ideas there excellent and when we do my next uh another webinar i'm doing is all about being linguistically um responsive to the kids that are in your room all right i'm gonna skip over a couple things because we're getting close on time we talked some about about play developing language, being socially and culturally appropriate, 
Um, there's a, another session that we do about social emotional development of young learner, English learners as well. Um, but uh, folks were asking about stuff at home. I wanted to make sure you know about this resource. So this is resource seven and eight on your um, handout, Standard Start at Home, a guide to early learning for parents and families. This is, you can download it in English and Spanish. This is not the kind of, like, you don't want to print off this, like, booklet and, like, send it home. That's too much. But maybe you pull little ideas from here. Maybe you make little videos and upload them to, you know, Seesaw or Class Dojo or whatever you're using. Um, or maybe you do it as part of, like, a family literacy or, like, a parent activity night. You can do some of these things and teach families how to do some of these different types of things at home with their kids. And, again, emphasize that they do it at home in their strongest languages with their kids. So that they learn math, you know, through the native language, for example. All right. Um, quick time check. Yeah, we don't have time. But all right, let me just tell you the answer to this one. How long does it take to become proficient in English? Because people were asking about this. To become academically proficient in any language, which includes English, the research tells us, is between five to ten years. Years before you are um, proficient in that language in terms of being able to read and write Um academic content. I mean, that's when we expect it out of English speaking kids from English speaking homes. We don't, we expect by third, fourth, fifth grade for them to be able to read um, independently without a lot of pictures and be able to read content and learn from it. Like science and social studies, same is true for kids um, learning another language. So this slide says four to seven, but it's like five to seven to 10 usually. Talked a little bit about pairing kids. Read alouds are great for developing language as well. All right. So let me tell you about these free resources on that links handout. I gave you one other link about um, have parents, uh, I'm sorry, what parents have to teach us about their dual language children. That's a really nice read. Click on that, read that later. But then that yellow highlighted area on the bottom, when you you know pull it up, you'll see there's this section down here. Um, it says your one-stop shop. That takes you to the dual language, the English learner section of our webpage of ECPL. And everything we do is free. And because of all the different partnerships we have with different organizations, you see over here, there are a ton of different resources for you on that webpage. Live webinars like this one. And we've got a whole nother series coming up, including two coming up in Spanish, exclusively in Spanish, and then a number in English as well. Some are mine, some are being presented by others. Um, we, I have a live online administrator academy through IPA, Illinois Principals Association. I think it's in April this year. Um, that's free. Downloadable resources, on-demand courses. And if you scroll all the way to the bottom of this page, when you get there, it looks like this. So you can either click on that link on the page, or if you'd like to scan QR codes with your phone, you could do that too. Scroll, it'll look like this. You scroll all the way down to the bottom and there's information about um, graduate level coursework and ESL bilingual credentials through both gateways and ISBE, as well as scholarship opportunities to take those classes. So uh, if this is whetted your, is that a word? Um, your appetite for this information, check it out on there. And uh, we've got more learning for you. Connect to us on social media. Oh, gosh, I can't believe that still says Twitter. I need to fix that. Um, X, uh, you know, connect to us and take a look at the content that, we, that we're putting out there. So thank you so much for hanging on. Sorry about my voice. I'm going to pass things back to 